I will be introducing um, the speakers for today. Uh, the first speaker uh, would be Dr. Thompson uh, Chengata, who is uh, the European Research Council Fellow on AI Ethics at the University of Southampton and also uh, a visiting scholar at the University uh, <clears throat> of Oxford. Um, also, uh, we have uh, Mary Stella Simiu, uh, who is currently a doctoral student and also a project officer at the Expression, Information and Digital Rights Union at the Center for Human Rights University of Pretoria. Then lastly, we'll be having Dr. Ololade Shailon, um, the Privacy Policy Manager for Middle East and Africa on Facebook. And before we um, go um, to the first speaker, who is Dr. Thompson, I would also like to uh, state my name. My name is Tommy Wailuri, and I am the alumni coordinator, and I um, also work with the Expression um, Information and Digital Rights Unit at the Center for Human Rights. So, and like I said, I'll be moderating um, today's session. Um, so, um, over to you now, Dr. Thompson. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tony, uh, for the introductions and uh, for the invitation to this uh, important uh, topic uh, during uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, so before I start my presentation, which is to do with um, access to internet in these times and whether that particularly is an issue of uh, a want or a need, I would uh, want maybe to start by sharing my screen. Uh, just a moment. I'm not sure if you are now seeing my screen. See, I can see. And I, I think everyone can also see. Okay, thank you very much. So in, in, in general, when I'm dealing with uh, this topic, my approach, uh, if you are seeing my screen now, is to look uh, at this, uh, what I'm calling the right to, to internet access during COVID-19 lockdowns in Africa, and particularly. And also during that discussion to try and explain whether, you know, human rights and digital ethics, so to say, uh, can work as a government, governance framework. And I'll be uh, discussing mainly two uh, two strands in that regard. First, to do with access to internet as a human right. And secondly, after someone is, uh, you know, uh, successfully, or if someone was to successfully access the internet, so to say, as a right, how they are acting on, uh, on internet or online, these are like the individual duties when exercising that right to internet access. And as you may have say, uh, seen, I may start by saying that, uh, you know, as to why I have included, for example, the issue of digital ethics in this discussion, which ordinarily uh, would seem like a legal discussion, is that um, I, as a trained lawyer, and like many other legal scholars, uh, used to think, uh, or continue to think sometimes, that the law is a panacea in dealing with uh, social problems such as those created by digital, digital technologies and access to internet. Uh, yet uh, for the years that I've worked in the artificial intelligence field uh, and uh, legal, uh, on legal matters and, et 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 and ethics, so to say, I've recognized that the law um, you know, only provides us sometimes with the bare minimum that if you want to attain the maximum, possible, uh, you perhaps have to tend to other fields such as ethics. So starting with the uh, access to internet as a, as a human right, I think it is important to note that, you know, what has been the impact of uh, COVID-19 lockdowns on the exercise and enjoyment of human rights in general in Africa, so to say. And this is where I say the enjoyment, uh, you know, of human rights. Uh, particularly in Africa and other parts of the world is dependent on freedom of movement, on access to information, and sometimes accessing the government offices if, for example, your rights are not being fulfilled. Yet during these lockdowns, it's common cause that, you know, uh, these forms of access are severely restricted, which makes access to internet very, very critical as far as, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, you know, articulating uh, your, your rights, so to say. So it is at this point that I want to mention then that, you know, uh, already uh, briefly, you know, the rights of access to internet has been recognized or it continues to be emphasized by many scholars in other regional bodies, such as the African Commission, as far as it, it, is, it has links, for example, to the right to access to information and freedom of expression. For example, the special rapporteur, uh, upon the recommendations that were given by the African uh, Commission, the uh, African Union in their resolutions to revise the declaration, uh, you know, uh, the Africa, the de Declaration of Principles on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information in Africa, particularly notes that states, you know, and I'm quoting him verbatim, uh, that shall recognize that, uh, you know, the universal, equitable, affordable, and effective access to the internet is necessary for the realization of freedom of expression, uh, access to information, and the exercise of other human rights. You know, and he also says that, you know, the exercise of the right of freedom of expression and the right of access to information shall be protected from interference that is both online and offline, which means or which gives reference to the aspect of uh, access to, to internet, so to say. And lastly, uh, there's also an emphasis to say that states, when they are looking at the right to freedom of expression, shall interpret it to include the enjoyment of right of freedom of expression on the right of access to information in their digital dimensions. And when we're talking about digital dimension, this is where we are including, uh, you know, the aspect of access to, to internet. So in this particular regard, I, I have no doubt in my mind that, you know, the right to access internet is and uh, should be recognized or continue to be recognized as a, as a right, particularly in these times of COVID-19 lockdowns. Now, uh, having said that, the point which I then want to say is that, uh, you know, I, I want to give some sort of uh, examples during COVID-19 where access to internet is, uh, you know, been shown to be the medium through which other human rights are being exercised or enjoyed. And I have three examples which I want to discuss. And being from Zimbabwe, I just want to give uh, examples from, from Zimbabwe, the three which I'm referring to. The first one, which I say that access to internet is directly linked to the right to health. It's common cause that, you know, information regarding COVID-19, for example, which uh, places not to go, where to access certain uh, goods and services, have been largely been shared on, on the internet. And for those who may not be having access to internet, particularly for folks who do not have that access or who are in remote areas you know, or in rural Zimbabwe, so to say, uh, there is a limitation then or some sort of limitation on how then they enjoy their, their rights to, to, to health, so to say. I would also want to mention the second aspect of, or um, well, before I go to the second example, I would add to this that, you know, in, in relation to the access uh, and accessing on internet vital information re relating to health and, uh, uh, and the right to health, so to say, there's been a recent launch of the, what is known as the Africa Medical Supply Platform. You may have uh, heard about it uh, by the African Union relating to where governments uh, and other organizations can actually be able to purchase, you know, medical supplies that relate uh, to COVID-19. And for me, when I saw that the moment it was posted on African Union uh, website, for example, this is where you see that, okay, when you do have access to internet, you immediately get sometimes, or many times, so to say, information that is critical in, in uh, uh, in these uh, times where we, where we are in. Then the second aspect uh, or the second example, which I want to give also from Zimbabwe is that, you know, access to internet has been critical in as far as fighting corruption that is related to COVID-19. In, in Zimbabwe, you know, some weeks ago, because of access to internet and uh, online journalism or citizen journalism, so to say, on, online, we have seen that after the Zimbabwean government, including the first family itself, were involved in a scandal relating to goods and services that were meant uh, to, to, to for, for COVID-19, 
you know, uh, externalization of funds which were meant for fighting COVID-19 in what is popularly now started to be known as the, uh, the drug scandal or the drugs, uh, the drugs gate, so to say. Most of this anti-corruption movement and pro pro protestation, so to say, happened online. And it is individuals, it has not been for, for example, if it has not been for that access to internet, which uh, at least allowed to, you know, the citizens to some extent to be able to demand from the government to account for what was happening because uh, they were interfering, uh, so to say, with the right to health by engaging in corruption and externalizing funds that are meant for COVID-19. This is where you see the importance of uh, access to internet in these particular times. And the last example also, which I would give in, in terms of why access to internet uh, is linked to other rights and is important is the idea that there are also some unscrupulous government. Unfortunately, uh, I'm ashamed to say at this point that uh, you know my government may also fall in these uh, types of government that one may refer to as unscrupulous to say they may engage in activities that are meant, for example, for citizens to participate. For example, changing of the constitutions. You know, where for you to be able to change a constitution, you need const uh, constitutional consultations for citizens to participate. Yet, because the government was more interested in changing some of these uh, constitutional provisions without uh, adequate participation from citizens, they chose, for example, to do it during the time of COVID-19 lockdowns, where they know that no one would be able to confront and protest some of those changes. But you'd see that with access to internet, again, people will be sharing the information as to regards what is what the government is trying to change and where, for example, people can be lodging their complaints. Yeah, having given the, those examples and emphasize the point that access to internet is critical or is a right in terms of COVID-19 lockdowns, I want now to say that in the event or in, for those who are able to access internet, uh, I should also maybe mention the aspect of uh, duties and rights where now one is online, particularly during this COVID-19 uh, 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 pandemic. It's again common cause that, you know, since the lockdowns, uh, COVID-19 lockdowns, people spend more time online, you know? And when people spend more time online, I'm asking the question to say that, uh, you know, from in this virtual world, which many people are, participate, are, are now living in, are we, for example, away, or away, so to say, from African uh, virtues? You know, does it mean that some of the ethos that binds us in the physical world now that we're spending more time online are no longer ap applicable? And in that regard, the special report on the freedom of expression again is mentioned that, you know, uh, 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 you know, when it comes to this particular, particular, particular rights, states shall adopt, for example, laws, policies, and other measures to promote affordable access to internet to protect users from online harm. And we see that within this COVID-19 uh, lockdowns, there have been an increase actually in terms of uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the type of harm that you find, you find online. And uh, before I mention or I give examples of those uh, online hates that we've been experiencing during these lockdowns, I want to refer to why I'm referring particularly to the aspects of saying that we have duties, even if we have rights when we have access to the internet. And this, I'm also plucking it, for example, from Article 27 to 29 of the African Charter on individual duties, you know. Yeah, we are a unique continent, as you may know, that we are one of perhaps, uh, you know, with the enabling uh, African Charter on Human Rights, which has also duties. And it particularly mentions that, you know, it is an individual, you know, or before I even try to quote that, if you look at the, uh, at the in particular, sorry to say, Article 29, uh, Article 29, subsection 7, it has got F, uh, echoes of African communitarian ethos, so to say, where it provides particularly that every individual or the individual has a duty to preserve and strengthen positive African cultural values in these relations with other members of the society in the spirit of tolerance, uh, uh, dialogue and consultation, and in general, to contribute to the promotion of moral well-being of society. And again, in terms of, of uh, Article 29.8 of the same African Charter, it is said that the individual also has a duty 
to contribute to the best of his abilities at all times and at all level to the promotion and achievement of African unity. Yet, what you see that is that there has been increased cases of uh, you know online net in particular. You know, if I were to give examples of in, in Zimbabwe and in South Africa of the, uh, xenophobia yet online. And this was actually contributed by what started uh, with government officials from South Africa, for example, uh, having discriminatory stances such as plaza shops are going to remain open, but only those that are owned by South Africans. And there were no specific reasons, the differentiation between why such policies were being made. And the second one being uh, the mentioning of the idea that we're going to build uh, a fence and erect a fence on the Zimbabwean, border, Zimbabwean South African border uh, to avoid people who are infected coming in. And at the point when that, those uh, suggestions are being made, uh, Zimbabwe actually had the lowest compared to the numbers of uh, infections uh, in, in, in South Africa. What that translated into, we see now the uh, developing of some time, uh, disinformation online, particularly on Twitter, where we had, uh, I think in the past week, trending hashtags, which are uh, here for, for example, the Zimbabweans must fall, the Nigerians must fall uh, hashtags. And if you look at the, if you go on those hashtags and look at them, you see information such as people complaining that they've not been able to get COVID-19 relief because the government of South Africa is putting foreigners, undocumented, uh, you know, uh, immigrants and, and drug lords first to get the, that relief. And everyone is retweeting that, and there's this already uh, 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 hype of head towards a particular particular community. And in this, it is in this regard that, of course, I one can mention that, you know, there is law that deals, you know, with issues of head on of head online. But as I have mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, and I'm moving towards uh, my end of discussion, you know that the law provides the minimum. And why I say this is because, for example, if you were to look at the 2019 case, end of 2019 case of uh, uh, Kwelane versus South African Human Rights Commission, it clearly distinguished actually the aspect to say what is only prohibited by law is hateful speech, not hateful, uh, uh, the, 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 the latter one. To simply say that someone can actually say something which is hateful, which may be even against, for example, African uh, ethos. African communitarian ethos of how we live, something which is, for example, been realized or recognized in the African Charter to say we should be promoting African unity, tolerance, and living as a, as a community. But as far as the law is concerned, there are certain messages which you can find online, which can be actually harmful, which can actually be hurtful. But as long as they do not reach the standard or the minimum standard which the, the law requires of symbols to say it should be head speech, then you, you, you won't be able to prohibit that. This is where I actually then think that, you know, you can have a better, a tie, a better chances of having a higher standard or attaining the maximum, if we start also emphasizing the issue of Afro-digital ethics on how people relate to each other online. And when I'm saying Afro-digital ethics, generally you're referring uh, to the aspect where we are saying that, uh, you know, digital ethics relates to how we, uh, you know, communicate, how we relate with, with each other online, in a morally or ethically acceptable uh, manner. And when you refer now to Afro-digital ethics, you are referring to those digital ethics that are primarily inspired by African philosophy, by African ethics, and some of these, although they may not be the same across the continent, they have common commonalities in as far as the idea that uh, us as Africans, we've always operated with Ubuntu, to say treat the other one as brother as a brother treat the other one as a sister in general as my ending statement with those African ethos we even say or co conceptualize a human being by their good behavior or how they treat other humans to the extent that for example in my country if you are not being a good uh, member of a community someone can actually say Ausimun as to say Ausimun meaning you are not a person, as in the way you are acting is against uh, being humane. So if those same approaches were to be used online, because it seems it is lacking now, 
uh, generally because of what other African philosophers have noted to say there's a, an assumption that when someone is online that they, they don't have responsibility. There's no immediate uh, accountability for your actions. So people started, start behaving in any way they can. And perhaps it may be important to adopt the approach with the investor Pretoria through the Information uh, Excellence Center, for example, where we say there should be educational tools and Afro-digital ethics being taught to people right from the beginning. And the comparative approach on digital ethics and regulation of social media, for example, of what the UK Center of Data Ethics and Innovation and the Alan Turing Institute are doing may be helpful in regulating how we are relating on each, with each other online during these difficult times. I would want to end on that. Thank you very much for, for giving me the chance to say this. Thank you so much for that um, beautiful presentation, Dr. Tengata. And um, before we go on, we would uh, be, as, as we go on, we will be having a number of polls where um, participants would kindly help to complete. And um, uh, it's to help us do our in-house evaluation as, as an organization. And thank you as you, as you complete those. Um, next, um, next on the schedule is Mary Stella Simiu who will be speaking to us on the role of technologies on democratization during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Mary Stella, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tomiwa. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I'll start to talk about the role of technologies on democratization. And it's a very broad topic, so I thought to narrow it down and just talk about the role of technologies in election campaigns and situate it specifically in the COVID-19 context. Um, so look at the 2020 election calendar in Africa. So far, eight countries have conducted a form of election. Uh, 12 others have postponed their elections and seven others are still uh, scheduled to conduct some form of election in 2020. And I believe for all of these countries, at some point they had to determine whether what impact will be there in conducting the election or postponing the election. For those who postponed the election, I believe they had to determine whether the constitution allows for the, post, for the postponement of the election and whether there's legislation that provides for the postponement of the election, and whether in doing so it will plunge the country into a constitutional crisis. And for those who decide to continue the election, I believe they had to determine whether they had actual health and safety measures in place, whether these measures were effective, and whether they could be able to reassure voters that in participating in the electoral process, they will not compromise their own health. So ideally, democratic processes should feature wide political campaigns, as well as broad public debates on public policy issues. This allows the development of an informed electorate going into the electoral process. But we know that COVID has actually challenged the ability for this to happen. And ideally, right now, the virus has not peaked in Africa and their prediction that we are looking at a looming spike in cases. And I think it would be unwise for countries to downplay the, the risk presented by COVID-19 to elections. And we have seen this happen in, in Burundi, which already had the elections recently, as well as Tanzania, that is yet to have its election in 2020. I believe stakeholders in this process have to decide whether in continuing the voting process, are they able to protect the health of the voters as well as election officials and the general public in such a way that elections will take place, the health of the general population is maintained. So I thought to look at what practices some of the countries that have already held the elections adopted when it comes to political campaigns. We have Malawi that had the rerun of its 2019 presidential elections that were just done recently. And there were reports that although the political parties in Malawi had acknowledged yes, they are these data presented by COVID-19 and they promised to adhere to certain prevention guidelines. In practice, what was seen by extravagant roads and rallies were attended by thousands of people. There was little to no physical distancing and very few of the participants uh, wore any face masks. There was an opposition rally that was, uh, well, was done by Tonsi Alliance which it was reported that there were hand washing facilities, but very few people actually made use of these facilities and very few people uh, followed social distancing guidelines. This was ignored. The turnout for this election in Malawi was registered at 64%, which is moderate. 
And on 23rd June, the election was held. They had 803 cases of COVID. And by yesterday, the cases had spiked to about 1,265. Malawi has also had its elections this year, and it registered a very low turnout of 35.6, although they, they also have a security crisis that is ongoing. On 29th March, when they had the election, they had 18 cases of COVID. Uh, 9th March, they had a second round of elections where the COVID cases had increased to 294. And by yesterday, the cases had risen about 2,202. In Mali, in Mali, they adopted traditional campaign methods such as in-person campaigns as well as billboards. I finally looked at Benin, which had a turnout of 49.14%, which is still low. On 17th May, when they had elections, they had 339 cases. And in 1st July, they had 1,199 cases of COVID. But in Benin, there was a ban on gatherings of more than 50 people. So for any political candidates, they had to cancel their rallies and they limit their campaign using posters and media appearances. So I'm not saying that it's only the conduct of elections that led to the spike of cases in these countries, because we have seen spikes in all other countries. But we have to ask ourselves whether the situation and how we do political campaigns in Africa and worldwide are conducive during this context. And this brings the question whether <coughs> how we conduct political campaigns during COVID-19. It goes without saying that its traditional rallies are not feasible in a context of a public health crisis. While we still have traditional media, including TV, radio, and some expert print that are still largely relied upon by a large segment of the population when it comes to campaign reports and electoral discourse, we see that new media is actually emerging, not only to supplement traditional media, but it's also a primary source of information for certain segments of the population, especially the youth. And we can see that these solutions are actually coming up, especially in social media, as well as paid advertising on social media. We have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have Twitter, we have Snapchat, we have YouTube, we have email, websites, all these which are to share political information. Facebook and Instagram additionally allow for live streaming, which facilitates you know, interactive sessions between political candidates and their audience. Um, IG, Instagram, that is, also allows for features to post questions during the post as well as polls. One minute. And for other candidates, sorry, <laughs> I was in my breath. Some other candidates, they use mobile phone applications which you can download from Apple or Android. This has not been used in Africa. And so this brings the question, is it effective to use these solutions in Africa? So in Africa, the problem is that we have limited technological capacity in many African countries. And I'm glad that uh, Thompson talked about it to some extent. I'm sorry. As, uh, Thompson talked about it to some extent. But the problem is that it's a digital divide that we have seen in Africa. 28.2% of the population are using the internet, mostly these men, and 22.26, which are female. And other than digital divide concerns, we have problems of poverty. We have issues of illiteracy, specifically digital illiteracy. We have issues of cost of data. We have issues where we see social media taxes that have been implemented in certain jurisdictions, such as Uganda. And in some certain aspects, we've seen the passage of draconian cybersecurity laws that impede free speech. These um, in instances. And so we are seeing in reports of internet shutdown. And we can also encourage the use of other solutions, which are limited to some extent when it comes to digital, because we can use bulk messaging as well as peer-to-peer -peer text texting. And in some certain aspects, we are encouraged to use WhatsApp groups where you can share information. And then this brings the question, what are the risks presented it comes to using digital solutions in political campaigns. Digital solutions allow for the use of micro-targeting strategies that are directed towards certain tasks. This provides for more fine-tuned aspects as compared to traditional media. And one issue that brings a risk is the right to privacy. Because when you look at certain aspects, for example, some apps provide for some permissions where they ask certain people to give me access to your contact list, give me access to your photos, give me access to your social media accounts, give me access to your location information. And all these 
uh, political party candidates to achieve a very highly detailed understanding of the behavior and opinion of voters. We know there are different segments of voters. We have supporters, we have opponents, and we have undecided voters. And all this information, uh, political parties and candidates are able to harness all this information to build the profile of their supporters and use the data to target others which have seen likes and build their support base as well as send targeted online advertisements to these people. So the thing with targeted ads, we look at supporters. If you're going to send targeted ads to supporters, you have to see whether I send this message to them. Are they able to harness the support for this base? If I'm going to send targeted ads to opponents, am I able to encourage them not to vote for a particular candidate? If I'm going to send targeted ads to us, undecided voters, which who I believe are mostly targeted when it comes to these votes, are they able to sway them not to vote a particular candidate, but can vote for me? And so most targeted ads actually target towards undecided voters. And this brings me to another concern when it comes to uh, misinformation, that comes towards political campaigns in this in these settings, and one of these is in misinformation and disinformation. And worryingly, we see that false news spreads faster when it comes to online platforms. And false news spreads faster when, and to a larger audience as compared to the truth. And it's unfortunate that when information is retracted, it never actually has the same traction as when it is, is as the original piece of information, and this is very worrying. And what's worrying is that disinformation deliberately targets and highlights the differences of societies, be it, is it the supporters, is it your political leaning, is it your ethnicity, is it your religious? So it ends up harnessing or spotlighting or highlighting the differences in society and using it to divide societies. And what happens in the electoral context is that when this is highlighted, it skews public decision making, it skews public debate, and it impedes the development of an informed electoral electorate. And you see that this information has ability to affect the behavior of voters as well as the outcome of an election. And this brings us to the question of how are we able to manage false news? <coughs> and this brings in the question of the role of social media companies. Face B, face, sorry, Facebook has a third party act for fact checking information, but interestingly, this is political ads. In 2019, Twitter decided it will stop running political ads, and this has brought about debate on free speech, the volume of information online, and the ability to proper fact check information. And we have to actually wonder, given the capacity of Twitter and Facebook, are they able to fact check all the user generated content on their website? Are they able to employ all their resources to fact check all the political ads that come, all the political ads that run through? their system as well as the user generated content. This needs a lot of uh, financial capability as well as resource capability. But I'd rather push for the sole responsibility of citizens such that citizens are able to verify information in these platforms before they share it to all their networks. So for example, if I see information before I can share it to anyone, I can fact check first, is this true? I can look at other sources online and confirm that this information is, is true. We can also encourage political parties as well as candidates to ensure that they adopt cyber hygiene practices. For example, the regular security software updates, the adoption of backup systems, strong firewalls, secure Wi-Fi, and if you're working remotely, use a good VPN, and also the use of strong passwords. But actually moving forward, we have to ask certain questions when it comes to political campaigns. Are politicians able or allowed to block people, delete comments, given that these platforms, be it Facebook, be it um, Twitter, be it Instagram, given that these platforms are used to, 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 to actually engage in allowed to block people in these platforms. And actually beyond political campaigns, we have to start asking questions around, are we able to harness the advantages of voting technologies? For example, are we able to adopt online vote? Are we able to adopt mobile voting? And it's unfortunate because of the digital divide, this capacity is not available in Africa because while other countries, for example, New Zealand, Estonia do have the capacity to do this, in Africa it's not so much. They are not, we are not in a position to do this as much as in other 
uh, in the African countries, sorry, in other West countries. But the thing is, given the context that we are in in COVID, we have to start looking at other digital solutions that will allow us to continue the democratic process. All these we have to also consider what is the question of the integrity of the election process. When we adopt digital solutions such as online voting, what happens to the principle of secrecy of the ballot? What happens to bribery? What happens to coercion of voters? And I believe all these questions we need to examine in this context. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Stella, for that awesome presentation. And also listening to um, Dr. Chengeta and yourself in the past few minutes, I've also, um, you know, brought up important questions. So um, for me, for example, uh, in 2012, we, we had one of the fathers of the internet uh, saying boldly and asserting that the internet cannot be a human right, but rather as a means of enabling other human rights. He was quoted in the New York Times to have said that, I quote, uh, there is a high bar for something to be considered a human right. Uh, loosely put, it must be among the things we as humans need to live healthy and meaningful lives, like freedom from torture or freedom of conscience. It is a mistake to place any particular technology in this exalted category, since over time, we will end up valuing the wrong things. Listening to you guys, a end of quote rather, sorry, after wrong things, end of quote. Listening to you guys have, um, you know, brought up, uh, it should bring up a sharp critique of uh, Vincev's position. Because in 2012, uh, we were not facing a pandemic. And judging from uh, Vincev's uh, position, uh, that, that uh, then nothing, it, it, it has nothing to, not meaningful impact to, to our lives. But that right now has changed. Uh, like Thompson had said earlier, uh, most of our lives depend on the internet. So uh, perhaps if uh, Mr. Seth has another opportunity to, uh, restate his position, maybe that might change. And also given the light of conversation that has happened here so far. So uh, that uh, brings me to, and also before I go to the last uh, speaker, if you please have any question, please kindly post them on the group chat. And uh, depending on how much time we have left, we will try and see um, the, how much of the questions we can take. So, uh, uh, next now is the, uh, the final speaker for the session, um, who is Dr. Ololaide Shailon, uh, who is the Privacy Policy Manager for the Middle East and Africa for Facebook. Um, over to you, Dr. Shailon. Thank you very much, Tamiwa. Um, so my role here today really is just to like give um, an overview and insight into some of the work Facebook is doing to sort of address the pandemic. Um, I'm gonna speak about three main areas we're working on. The first is our data for good initiative, um, which is basically uh, focused on how we can sort of use data um, in today's data-driven world to, to help humanitarian issues across the world. Um, the other thing I'm gonna talk about is our efforts to ensure that in the midst of this pandemic, people get reliable information and reduce the spread of, this, of misinformation, as Maricela has already referenced in her presentation. And the final um, group of, of um, efforts is really about what we're doing to keep communities connected and to ensure that people who need help in one way or the other are able to get the help that they need. Um, and so, first of all, in looking at our data for good initiatives, um, we are basically trying to focus on how um, to address humanitarian issues, like I mentioned. And I should say, this is not a new initiative at all. This is something we've been doing for a couple of years. But of course, with COVID um, coming into play, we've sort of tried to leverage and expand on that work to be able to assist um, governments and you know, local researchers in, in the efforts to, to prevent uh, uh, um, COVID. And one thing I want to emphasize is that even though we're speaking very broadly about the right to health um, and the importance of, of data in this regard, um, one other right that is very important is also the right to privacy. So we are also conscious as we try to use data for good 
for social good um, across the world of the need to balance those efforts you know, with the right to privacy. And so what we try to do with this, in this regard is to ensure that all our products by default are respecting privacy. And what we do is we try and make sure we aggregate and they identify, they identify the information that we use from Facebook or from any other sources as we do this work um, in the Data for Good initiatives. So there are like two main things we've done so far. Um, we have our high resolution population density maps and we also have um, disease prevention maps that we have rolled out in response to COVID specifically. In terms of our high resolution um, maps, um, so what we do is that we, we sort of use information, we don't use information from Facebook for, for the high resolution population density maps. What we do is we use census data from countries as well as satellite imagery. Um, and what this then does is that it helps us to generate um, you know, images um, and, and maps that shows like um, the density of population in different areas across the world. And most recently in terms of what this has done in terms of COVID it has been the World Bank um, using the population density maps that we have produced to predict where in Spain that they felt there was need to have extra testing facilities and also where there was going to be need to have more um, beds in hospitals to treat the pandemic because we know Spain was badly ravaged by the pandemic um, as well. The other um, types of maps we've done are three that were released, I think, in April. There are three of them. So the first one is a co-location maps, which basically are looking at the probability that people in one particular area have come into contact with people in another area. And this was really to help us to estimate um, where COVID cases might appear in the future, and then to share that information with, with um, researchers and with, with, with governments to sort of be able to predict what will happen. Um, another set of maps was the movement range trends, which at the regional level basically show whether people are staying at home or whether they are moving, like they're highly mobile and moving across town. And this was basically to help predict whether or to understand whether or not measures that the government were taking to prevent COVID spreading were actually working. And the final one is the social connectedness index, which basically shows the kinds of friendship that exist across states and across countries and was really critical in helping um, forecast the likelihood of the disease spreading, you know, um, across the hardest hit areas um, around the world. One last map that recently we, we um, that was launched is the, is the symptom map. Um, so this has been done by the Carnegie Mellon University in partnership with Facebook. Um, and what happens is that uh, it's, it's really like a, a, a symptom map a survey that is done to sort of help people to sort of um, you know, um, voluntarily share whether or not they are having any symptoms of, of COVID and to be able to then estimate exactly um, the prevalence of COVID, you know, across, across the world. In this regard, to emphasize the privacy protection, there is a fact that, so the Facebook only provides the link to the survey. The survey is actually done on a separate website that is, you know, hosted by Carnegie Mellon. Um, and then they then use the information they gather to then come up with a map to determine exactly where the symptoms are being um, are being seen. Um, moving on to the second um, group of, of work we've been doing is really about reliable information, conveying reliable information. Um, and so we've we launched a COVID-19 information center and what how this works is that it's, it's country by country and so um, you can go to that, uh, there's a link, you can go to the link and then all the relevant information about COVID is provided there um, from the WHO and also from the local health authority. For example, in South Africa, the, the National Agency, the National um, Department of Health. And that um, website hosts all the information you, want, like you might want to have about you know, COVID um, in that particular country. So that is available right across Africa and right across the world. Um, the other thing that we, we also launched was um, the, the, the bot messaging service via, via WhatsApp. Um, so we have, we, we worked with the WHO to, to, um, to roll that out and then the WHO actually sends alerts um, to, you know, to individuals to tell them more information about the disease and give them tips about to prevent um, the contacting of, uh, of, of the disease. We're also working with UNICEF as well, using Messenger to sort of spread the news. Um, and in very few countries like in South Africa, there was a WhatsApp helpline that was also launched. 
uh, in partnership with the South African um, um, National, National Health Agency. And that has been launched in five languages, English and, and local languages, to give information about you know, COVID and also is interactive. Um, people can send questions and inquire about you know, different things and they will receive responses to guide them about, about COVID prevention. So more specifically about what we're doing to tackle misinformation. Um, I mean, this is not something that is new. We had the Ebola outbreak you know, a few years ago and we've sort of tried to leverage on what we did at, at that time in the case of COVID. Um, and so any information, misinformation that we believe is going to lead to imminent harm, we, we take it off the platform. Um, so for example, things about cures or treatment or like saying you need to drink bleach um, or, or things about um, claiming things like social distancing doesn't work. All those kind of spreading of misinformation we ad address and we, um, and we, we remove from, from our platforms. Um, we've also banned um, ads and listens that imply that, um, you know, um, taking a particular kind of product will guarantee, prevent, prevent you from getting, like, getting COVID, for example. Um, or saying, you know, um, for example, taking a particular herb will prevent COVID. Those kind of things are banned as, as ads on our platforms. And also um, fact-checking. Um, we work with fact checkers around the world, a lot of them based in Africa as well, to basically debunk claims around, you know, um, you know, COVID. And what we do is that once, uh, you know, it's flagged, and there are different ways it's flagged, like people report, um, you know, for things that they believe is false, um, generally speaking. And once that is flagged, the fact checkers look into it, and they then label to say that, you know, this is actually, you know, um, not necessarily only false or, or or not, but for example, it could be that the headline is the, the, the headline is false, or the story is partly false, just to give context and help people to understand, you know, what the dangers um, are. And as at match, you know, in terms of um, the data we have, we, we, we were able to label about 40, 40 million different posts. And what we discovered is that once posts are labeled, 95% of the time, time, people do not actually go ahead to view, you know, what the post actually says. So to that extent, um, it's actually uh, one of the good ways or one of the um, viable ways of trying to reduce misinformation, generally speaking, but also in terms of um, the COVID pandemic. And finally, looking at some of the efforts we've taken to sort of ensure people are connected during this period. So one is community help, um, which basically makes it easy for people to request help. So for example, if you're an elderly person living all by yourself, you can use this, um, this tool to request help from people within your area. For example, if you need to do grocery shopping, they can help you with things like that. So that's one thing um, that we've done with regard to community help. Um, we're also working very closely with local governments and emergency health organizations um, to reach people. So for example, using local alerts to communicate urgent information to say, for example, this is, um, there's a spike in, you know, in COVID, um, um, positive COVID tests in your area. You need to take X, Y, Z precautions to ensure that you are not, you know, um, affected. So that's some, some of what we do. Also, we have um, collaborated with local governments to, to help with um, providing workplace. Um, so workplace is an app, providing workplace as an um, app, as a tool um, to collaborate in terms of fighting COVID for free for a couple of months for governments that need it. Um, we're also supporting, you know, international organizations like the WHO and, the, and UNICEF with free ads to run on our platform, like on Facebook, also sharing accurate information about, about COVID and, and how to prevent the disease. Um, and we also share um, well-being tips uh, and resources you know, on our platform and, and also are donating to organizations that are supporting mental health, mental health crisis um, helplines um, during this time. Uh, and something that is more specific to South Africa, um, in May we partnered with the South African um, National Blood Services to encourage blood donation um, because we, we started to see that there was a significant decrease in blood donations with the lockdown and uh, social distancing and people were really concerned that maybe if they donated blood it could weaken their immune system um, and make them more susceptible to COVID or actually get infected um, with COVID and so how it works is that over 18s are invited like on Facebook to register as a blood donor and then once um, we see that there is information um, that around your area, the blood centers are running short with blood supply, 
you are then given that information and then uh, and encouraged to actually go out to donate blood. Just to flag in also in terms of how we ensure that you know we protect privacy. Um, so registering is something that is like it's not once you register the information that you've registered to be a blood donor is not visible to anybody else but yourself and even the prompting is only visible to yourself. So if there's no risk of you know people being able to sort of figure out exactly what is happening and what you're trying to do. So that is um, in a nutshell the three big buckets of work we are doing um, we've been doing over the last couple of months in relation to um, fighting COVID. Data for good initiatives, um, fighting misinformation and also trying to help um, communities to bond together and help each other um, in terms of um, staying um, protected and, and preventing COVID. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shailon. That was uh, very um, enlightening. And um, so now we are moving to uh, the questions. And I would like to say thank you to our speakers and also to our participants. We have participants from Cameroon, from Uganda, from Mauritius, and from India, from the, and also from the rest of the world. And um, moving now on to the questions, um, like I had said earlier, um, my first question would go to Dr. Chengeta. So my, 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 uh, my first question would be, uh, like I had pointed out earlier, uh, one of the fathers of the internet had said that uh, due to the fact that there is a high bar for something to be considered a human right. Uh, and in his view, human rights, uh, the internet access for now can be, you know, uh, be referred to, can be considered as a substantive uh, right, rather it's an enabling one. And given your presentation so far, um, would you perhaps have any response to that? Do you think uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is, is raising the bar so high that it's now in the clouds that we need to now start considering um, the internet as, as a human right? Thank you. Over to you. Yes, uh, you can hear me now, right? Um, Okay, th thank you, thank you very much, Tommy, for the for the question. Uh, before I uh, before I answer it, I I was noting also some questions that were directed to me. Uh, would you allow me to address them now after addressing your question? That is fine. That is fine. It's okay. Okay. So uh, in answering your question, I think what I would basically say is that uh, in addition to the reasons why which I have noted or explained why uh, you know, the right to access to, or access to internet should be uh, conceived as a right, and also the jurisprudence of what has gone, especially in the African continent, from the African Commission and other regional bodies in explaining why, uh, for example, access to internet is part of the right to uh, freedom of expression and access to information. I would say that his opinion, of course, everyone uh, you know, can freely express themselves on what they see uh, in certain things, but I would want to give an example. You would agree with me that at a certain time you know, in the history, there they were people, for example, who didn't think, for example, the right to vote is a right, is a right. who believed that you know, only certain people were allowed or should be allowed to vote or other people don't, don't have, uh, but those opinions change over time. So, it is critical, I think, to realize at this particular point in time that we are in different times than uh, what, you know, we may have perceived to say, you know, access to internet should not be uh, uh, realized or recognized as, as a right. But in the current moment, in particular, where you find that there is a clear link or direct link between the exercise of certain rights and uh, access to internet, it is really fundamental that, uh, you know, it is recognized as such or that jurisprudence or courts across the globe or governments across the globe recognize it as such. Now, uh, allow me to address some of the questions that I've seen which, has been, which were directed to me. The first one, I think there was um, uh, a person, Mahima, who uh, considers or who said that, you know, uh, the right to access to, in, to, to internet cannot, for example, be seen as a right, or, uh, uh, as a right if there is no technical know-how on how to use the internet or the technologies that are associated with that. I would, I would particularly agree on the aspect to say that, you know, technical know-how and knowledge of how to use these technologies is fundamental. It is actually part of uh, the right to access to the internet because if you were to look at the uh, 
uh, comments or the revised declaration on access to information in Africa, which was uh, done by the special rapporteur on, uh, regarding freedom of expression, he particularly actually noted the government obligation to be able to train, you know, uh, its citizen and everyone else on how to use these this digital technologies because uh, it's critical in exercising this particular right. Then uh, there was a question which was posed by Nakili, uh, Nakili Fitz, please forgive me if I'm not uh, pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, you asked on one of the examples which I gave to say is there been uh, you know, online harassment of whistleblowers uh, online regarding you know, uh, the corruption associated, for example, with COVID-19. Yes, there have been actually. Uh, I can give you, you examples, for example, Wopo Shingono, who was uh, leading the unearthing of what is known as the drug scandal, this company called Drugs, which was a fictitious uh, company formed by, by a friend of the first family to loot funds for which were meant for COVID-19. The spokesperson of ZANPF, the ruling party, uh, uh, and, and also another group uh, within that party came online and, uh, and, and, and also published in form of videos where they particularly attacked these particular individuals and warning them with uh, uncertain uh, threats to say that they should desist from dragging the name, uh, the name of the first family in, in, in the mud. And what you would not actually there, which is really also an issue of ethics and disinformation, you find that the government, that particular moment when they are threatening the lives of Wopo, you know, they completely deny links to the person who formed drugs to say, we don't know him, he's not part of whatever, we, we don't even have any personal business relationship with him. Later on online, we see photos of him being with the uh, first lady, with the president, of him being with the son of the president, and uh, then the issue changes again. So this is again an issue of uh, uh, you know, ethics on the part of uh, government as far as uh, the information that you give to your, to your citizens. You also find that there are also abusive tweets, you know, on Twitter, you know, of those who are condemning this kind of corruption related to COVID-19. And uh, we have ministers, the recently fired minister, Energy Mutodi, who, for example, for those who were uh, campaigning or protesting against, against this corruption, we find him, them being uh, kidnapped, tortured, and then uh, uh, sexually assaulted by government officials and then dumped in a certain city. And we have a minister of the government coming online and making fun of that uh, particular incident, you know, showing complete the, you know, dissent or discouragement and saying hateful information to say, oh, maybe there were some disagreements with their boyfriend, God partners, that the ones who abused them and certain things like that. And when you see that information like that coming online from these government officials, someone could say, this doesn't qualify as prohibited hate speech. And it doesn't. You wouldn't be able to, to, to pin it that on as far as the law is concerned. This is where I was emphasizing to say the importance of digital ethics and how actually we relate to each other uh, as, as, as humans. And there's also been the use of uh, ghost accounts from the likes of Matigari and others who uh, constantly try to you know, uh, derail efforts of trying to fight against corruption related to COVID-19. Lastly, uh, sorry uh, to me for taking uh, a bit of time. I would want actually to ask questions to my co-panelists, if you may please allow me. Uh, the first question, uh, just one question for, for each. The first question uh, to uh, Dr. Ololade uh, Shilun um, on, on in misinformation and disinformation uh, relating to COVID-19. Uh, I just wanted to know, you know, uh, there, there has been conflicting information from, um, from medical experts on the matter. For example, how to approach the issue of COVID-19 or whether if, for example, it is what people say it is in terms of some medical doctors and associations in the United States. So in terms of information ethics, sorry for again, breaking you to ethics, in terms of information ethics, how do governments and organizations like yours choose which information to share and uh, to what uh, degree, you know? So the, the information on COVID-19, which people are sharing to say this is the correct information, are coming from a group of medical experts and the other medical experts who are saying the opposite. How do you make that ethical decision? What is the moral reasoning behind to saying this one is the one which I'm going on? Uh, 
going with. Because as perhaps as people were accessing the information, we're not expecting that, and expressing that uh, particular whatever saying to different things. And secondly, uh, there are currently development of AI algorithms that can automatically, for example, detect and delete, delete certain information online. Uh, and these are like largely discussed, for example, by the Alan Turing Institute here in the United Kingdom. And, uh, you know, ethically speaking, would you be all right or would you be okay, for example, uh, with such algorithms deleting uh, certain information which may be deemed inaccurate? you know, as far as COVID-19 is concerned. I know like currently sometimes just flagging, how about just uh, saying, I detect that this information uh, is, is inaccurate and then the alg algorithm automatically deletes that particular information. And lastly, my question to Mary is, um, you know, political currency of many opposition parties is in protest. Uh, you know, particularly this idea of taking protests to the streets, especially on issues of disagreements. Do you think in this uh, COVID-19 lockdowns particularly, is it ethically acceptable or ethically uh, fair to take measures for the government of the day to take measures that are politically contentious, you know, or provoking to, to opposition parties, uh, political parties, knowing fully well that they cannot be able to protest on them or you know, use their political currents of protesting in the streets because they are, they are lockdown measures. Those, those, those would be my questions. Thank you very much uh, for, for the time given. Um, thank you so much, Thompson, for your questions. And also to be able to save time, um, I would just, I would advise that um, uh, our other two speakers also maybe take note of uh, a number of questions in the group chat, for example, particularly questions from Pascal and Jeanne on to Mary Stella on the, uh, on the issue of inclusion when it comes to digital campaigns and what impact that would have uh, in, in fairness and, and, and free, in fairness and for free uh, elections, uh, considering that um, physical, um, physical voting won't be possible given, given our current realities. How do we ensure inclusion? For example, uh, Pascal had mentioned maybe in rural areas where they, what they have access to most of the time is traditional media and they don't have access to the internet. How do we ensure that the internet also ensures, uh, carries along everyone and you know, reflects the wishes of everyone uh, uh, at the same time? And for Dr. Shailon, in addition to what um, uh, Dr. Tom uh, Chengeta had said, uh, just be grateful if you can kindly consider a question from Lauren Schaffner, who uh, is asking what the oversight mechanisms are uh, in place by Facebook to make sure that the right to privacy is preserved. And if we have more time, we can take more questions, but that will be all for now. Thank you so much. Uh, who, sorry, who, who would like to go first? Uh, Mary I, I can, yeah, I can start first. Um, so far, there's, there's an interesting question here from um, one of the participants about how Uganda election management body has declared that the elections will be conducted virtually. I think that we need more information, like what aspects of, of the election will be conducted virtually and what aspects will at least be done traditionally, because of course we can't do virtual voting, for example, online voting, if you do not have the constitutional and legislative basis for it if you do not have the technological capacity for it so it will help to know how else they are going to conduct it virtually because at this moment i believe political campaigns might be able to do them uh, online you have the capacity but for the election itself you can't implement for example electronic voting if you don't have facilities for electronic voting you can't implement online and um mobile voting if you do not have the capacity to actually do this. So that would be interesting to look at in the, in the context of Uganda. Um, on the question about the inclusion of rural areas, this brings back to the discussion of the digital divide, because most people who will benefit from digital solutions are those who are in urban areas, those who have internet activity, or those who are accessing these platforms using their phones. But unfortunately in Africa, seems limited because of digital divide, a lot of rural people, people living in 
rural areas are, are sort of, you know, excluded when it comes to certain discussions that are essential to matters of public interest as well as public debate. And I think this just has to go into the decision making process of governments. Are we looking in the future? Are we looking into ways where we can harness the advantages of digital solutions by ensuring we have capacity to actually make use of this? Because as now, if we are to decide to actually do political campaigns online, majorly, and and maybe supplement what is there in traditional media, being TV, radio, and print, it will still mean there's a certain section that is being excluded, and that's just because we don't have the technological capacity to make this possible. And right now, it's hard to say a solution right now. It has to be for governments to consciously look at their planning capacity and see that this is something we have to adopt in the future. Otherwise, for rural communities, in terms of political campaigns, I believe it will just have to be TV, radio, and print, and those who are able to access the internet through their phones, they'll have to use uh, their data, depending on the cost of the data, to be able to access political candidates as well as political parties. Yes, I don't think there's another question that was one Nito, where he talked about um, Talks about South Africa and moving to electronic team. That also depends whether the election management body as well as the government has, you know, changed the law if it needs to be changed to adopt a certain method of voting and whether they have been able to finance this. So for electronic voting in Africa, I know so far it's only Namibia that has tried to adopt electronic voting and no other country in Africa as yet. So this, this context, we have the capacity to look at the political will, we have to look at all these aspects to ensure that if this new system of voting is adopted, we are able to ensure that the purpose of a free and credible elections are still maintained in this context. Yes, thank you. Okay, if I, if I can jump in and um, try and um, answer some of the questions that have been asked. So, um, Dr. Chengeta asked uh, two questions. Um, the issue of the conflicting, you know, um, information for medical experts. So yeah, um, th that that definitely is something that is happening. But really, we are not medical ex experts ourselves, and so like I mentioned earlier, we have um, the COVID Information Center, where basically we direct uh, information from the WHO, as well as the national um, institution in charge of health in that particular country. And so that's what, we, that's what we focus on. We direct people in the particular country to the WHO, and also we work with the WHO and UNICEF, international organizations working on these issues, as well as the national institution in charge, as we believe they are best placed to provide, provide the information that is relevant to the particular context and to the particular country. Um, that is how we've handled it so far. And, um, that is what we believe is what needs to be done. We cannot, you know, we are not experts ourselves in, you know, in medical issues, and we can only direct, you know, people to where we feel that they will get the, the relevant information at the international level, but also at the national level. Um, in terms of the other question about using AI algorithms, so like I mentioned during my presentation, we have different ways of detecting potential misinformation. So one obviously is when it's flagged by a user. Um, at the side of every post, you can see there's like um, a place where you can sort of report um, what has been, you know, posted there. And we also ask different questions as in why you're reporting it. So you can flag it that this post is, you know, it's misleading or, you know, it's, it's, it's not accurate. And that is what then triggers, um, you know, the fact checking. Beyond that also, uh, beyond it being flagged specifically or, you know, um, substantially, there's also when um, people make comments to someone else's post saying, for example, this is wrong, this is false, I know it's not the correct information. That also triggers us to say, okay, we need to actually fact check um, this information. And finally, we actually do use machine learning models um, but of course, this is not perfect. So what we do is that we try to use that to predict misinformation. And then we feed whatever successes we get back into our fact, like what the ratings our fact checking partners have already um, given. And we try to use that to better improve 
that process so that over time it can be better at predicting content that contains misinformation. So that is also a work in progress. So the, these are the three main mechanisms you use. So the answer really is in brief, yes, we do use machine learning to sort of try and predict um, misinformation, but that's something that we're trying to improve over time. Um, in terms of oversight mechanism, uh, um, the question is very vague, um, but I can say that we have basic principles at Facebook that govern how we um, deal with privacy. Um, there are seven of them. Um, the first one is in relation to control. So our principle is that we give you as the user control of your privacy. Um, if you check on Facebook, for example, we have different settings, like there's a privacy checkup tool that we launched earlier this year that allows you to very, very quickly, um, in a couple of minutes, look at your privacy settings, a quick one. And then, then you can go deeper into the privacy settings itself, but it gives you, you know, all the kind of controls that you need to actually take whatever action you want to take in terms of your, um, your, um, your, um, your, your privacy. We also help people to understand how their data is used. So we have a data policy that explains how do we collect the information, how is it used and how is it stored. All of that is there in detail um, that any user can you know, look at and sort of have an understanding of, of, how, of how we operate. We also do our very best to design privacy into our products from the very onset. Um, that is one key principle. And another principle is that we do work very hard to keep information secure of, of our users. Um, Another principle is that we, we recognize that like users own and can delete their information whenever they want to. So there is that option to delete your information um, um, in, the, in the privacy settings on Facebook. Um, and also improvements are, is, is constant. So we constantly are looking for ways to improve on privacy features across a family of apps. It's not like once one thing is done, we sit back and feel like you know, it's accomplished. It's a constant process of trying to improve on privacy. And finally, we, we are accountable. Um, so, I mean, that is in summary the principles. Uh, I don't know if that sort of addresses um, what the question is, but broadly speaking, those are the principles that we live by in terms of our approach to privacy. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for uh, your responses um, and to my, to my mind, and I hope to the minds of the participants, they've been very um, enlightening and I've shed more light to um, the issues that are being raised. And from, from here, we would also like you to kindly complete the last poll for today. I'm sure it has popped up on your screen. Kindly complete it. And um, as we move towards the end of the session for today, uh, from my side, um, I, I can get three major um, takeaways. One is that access to the internet uh, might not be a human right right now, but also our current realities have you know, shown us that uh, more people need more access, right? To be able to make more meaning and survive uh, the, the pandemic, especially in this part of the world. I am also able to understand from Maristella's um, presentation that um, states, especially member states within the region, needs to get more involved in um, uh, yeah, participation, especially when you're looking to scaling um, technologies, uh, scaling elections through technologies. Uh, what does that mean for real-time uh, participation on ground for, for Africans and, and the citizens in their countries? And also uh, from Dr. Shailon, I can, I, I can, I can I get a sense that um, private businesses are doing the most that they can, especially in reducing, mitigating the, uh, um, the negative impacts of this um, uh, virus on our human rights and well-being in general. And so um, that brings us to the end of today's session. I want to say a special thank you to uh, each of the speakers for today. We are very grateful, Dr. Chengeta, Mary Stella, and Dr. Shailon, uh, for your insightful comments and taking the time to you know, share your views with us on the various topics uh, you, you talked about today, we are very grateful. And also to the participants, uh, thank you for joining us. And um, thank you, and we hope to see you as soon as uh, we have another uh, program scheduled, uh, hopefully next week. And yeah, see you then. Thank you so much. <laughs>